Okay, so one other thing that I'll talk about, I've kind of talked about this already on, in the earlier slide, but I find experiments to be kind of very valuable in, in, in testing individual hypotheses, but you have to be able to string them together to really test kind of a, uh, a, a bigger goal, like getting to product market fit or making sure a feature actually works. You actually string together multiple experiments. So there's usually this process of breaking the experiments down into, into a series of experiments and tying them together. So this is the iteration pattern that I talk about in the book as well. And so you, and I've already illustrated that with the book example too, where you start with understanding problems through interviews, you then define solutions, you then validate qualitatively and then quantitatively. And so that is kind of a path that we use. And I'll again illustrate how that looks like from a canvas perspective. So this is how we, we tackle risk uh, on the canvas. So I mentioned the starting point um, for all canvases will be with, the, with, with these three risks. So you have product risk, customer risk, market risk, and then that is the iteration pattern of understanding problem, defining solution, qualitative, and then quantitative. And so let's just walk through how you, how you kind of navigate the canvas. So when you first start out with your ideation stage, you've got the canvas built, typically what you're doing are testing these three things. You're trying to understand if uh, you, if you have customer segments that represent a viable market, so that's the customer risk, you're trying to basically test problems. Are these problems that they have? That would be the product risk. Am I going to build something that's, that's worth building? And then you're trying to understand the existing alternatives. So how are they solving this problem today? Once you're armed with that information, you then go into that second stage where what you're now looking to do is test these three things. You're looking to test the solution. So we do that with the MVP, so we, we, or even a demo before the MVP. We, we, we say this is the solution we're going to build and see if, if customers will, will kind of buy into that. And again, most of that is qualitative on a verbal level. We are looking to kind of refine our early adopter list to say, are these really customers that we want to target? Um, and, if, and if they are, what are kind of the early adopters that are, that are kind of broken out from there? And then we want to test the revenue stream. So we want to say for, these, for this solution that we have in mind, we're going to charge you, you know, X dollars for it. Is that something you would pay for? Look for verbal commitments there. Once we go into the qualitative stage, we begin, to, so this is where we have the MVP out to them. We now start to test the value proposition. So we have got a handful of people using our product. We want to make sure that after the 30 day period, 60, whatever that time period is, they can come back to you and say, we love your product and because it did this for us. And if, that, if, if, if what they tell you matches the value proposition you set out to solve, then you're in, kind of in, in, in good territory because you've validated that the value proposition you went out to do was one that customers realized and are happy to, to kind of evangelize for you. And you're still doing this at small scale, so it's still the qualitative scale. And similarly, um, on the channel side, we're, we're looking still at more outbound channels, which we talked about early on. We don't yet have scale. We don't yet have ability to drive thousands of people to our site if we are trying to get to that scale. But we are still bringing people on at a smaller scale, you know, tens of people a week or something to that, to that effect. Um, on the revenue stream, we are all we're looking for are verbal commitments, or even in some cases, if you can do advance payments or prepayments, you're looking for that just to have some way to test that people are actually paying for your product. Um, once you launch the MVP out, you, you would want to have them go through your your payment your 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 conversion cycle and, and hopefully be able to collect the revenue and so make sure that you are delivering the value and they are paying for your product. So we're, we're demonstrating the full business model but at small scale. Then we go into that last stage where we begin to scale this up and that's where the key metrics become even more important. So at this stage, they're, they're good at informing what might be going wrong, what might be happening, but a lot of it is still very qualitative. But once we go into that quantitative stage, everything is kind of um, I would say not everything, but most of it is driven by the metrics that you're collecting, and you're then trying to drive that that engine of growth to where you can you can uh, you can actually make this be sustainable. So we're looking at key metrics, we're looking at scalable channels, and then we're also looking then kind of in, internally at our cost structure. So initially, I, I would do like if I was building a startup, I would do um, I, I I I would pick. Um, whatever solutions were out there that would help me take the product to market faster. So like I gave the example early on of say a Heroku-like service, which is one that is free to use initially, but once you start paying, it is one of the more premium, more expensive services. And if that ends up being something that's hard for me to scale, once I have a scaling problem, that may be one that I kind of revisit and say, instead of using Heroku, I, I go and use Amazon or I use Rackspace or I, use a, a, I, build a, I build another kind of a homegrown self-hosted thing. But th that's an example of, 
where optimization comes in. You actually begin to look at the business model and extract more efficiencies out of your, your costs at that point. So does this kind of make sense? So the idea here is that the business model is not really a dartboard. You don't just kind of haphazardly start to like test things um, and, and kind of do check marks, but there is really kind of a process. And, and this will not work for every product, but it's kind of a guideline which should give you a, a, a kind of a roadmap of, of the stage you're in and using that stage to inform what really matters and really not, not really even focusing on the rest. So like for me, I'm happy to pay Heroku because they, they mitigate a lot of my risks early on and they're free, you can't beat that. But at the same time, it may not be a viable solution once I have a scalable business model, but I'll revisit that at that point. Okay. Oh, and, and the one box that I didn't talk about is the unfair advantage. And I, I feel like that, again, is one where you ha it's, it's a discovery process. You have to really figure that out, what, you're, what is going to be your sustainable advantage. And hopefully, before you get to the third or fourth stage, preferably by the third stage. Because if you're close to that fourth stage, whether you like it or not, as I said early on, you will attract com uh, competitors in the marketplace. They will start to do very similar things, probably copy you, you know, line for line, feature for feature, because they think you're onto something, and it's much easier to copy than to actually do this for them, you know, do, build something from scratch. So you do have to kind of think about that, but it's not one that I put out there and went to test, because you will be tested whether you like it or not. So fortunately, that will happen. Um, 